professor of civil engineering and joined Roger Williams University in the fall of 2016. Um, she has a bachelor's degree in environmental engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute and received a PhD in civil engineering from UMass Amherst. She also holds a part-time faculty appointment with the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, her research focuses on the analysis of water quantity and quality in both natural and built hydrologic systems. Um, our second panelist is Jennifer Mobius. Um, she is the founder of Mobius Inc., an independent communications firm that helps companies in the business software and services and other technology sectors build solid brands and increase visibility, sales, and market share. Um, as an accomplished high-energy high PR and marketing professional, Jennifer has over 15 years experience championing local media, global media and analyst relations efforts, content marketing, social media strategy, and more for the high-tech and B2B sectors. And Betsy Hobbs, as a graduate of Cornell University School of Hotel Administration, Betsy has enjoyed a wonderful career in the hospitality industry for about 20 years. She has held a variety of sales and account management and leadership positions throughout her time with the Marriott, and has greatly valued the relationships that she has made along the way. Now, as a global account executive in Marriott's global sales organization, Betsy manages a diverse portfolio of 60 plus national association accounts, helping to be a central point of contact for all Marriott needs and across nearly 6,000 hotels and 30 brands. Thank you all for coming. Um, I think we're going to start off. Um, you guys can tell us a little bit about your career journey. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sure. Um, so, um, as was mentioned, I'm a faculty member here in the engineering program in civil engineering. Um, I did my bachelor's at a uh, bachelor's degree in environmental engineering at Worcester Polytechnic, um, Worcester Mass, from Massachusetts. Um, stayed relatively close my whole life. Um, and then I went over to UMass Amherst, where I got my master's in uh, environmental engineering and my PhD in civil engineering. Um, I started here and kind of also started at the same time a um, faculty, what's called a faculty appointment, um, part-time work with the U.S. Geological Survey. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with the U.S. Geological Survey. It's like part of the Department of the Interior. It's a branch that does um, a lot of uh, environmental work. So they, the group that I'm in does water work. So we're measuring stream flows across the nation. Um, figuring out how to translate that data into uh, things that are useful for making engineering decisions. So I kind of, I hold this joint appointment here and then also working with them, which the work with them is what we be mostly focused during the summer months when I'm not here teaching. So that's, that's my career journey. I'm still relatively um, new on my career journey. Um, so, you know, lots more to be more set up to this. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see, so I graduated from Boston College uh, with an English major, and probably like many of you, I had no idea what to do with an English major, if you have one. Um, you're much luckier if you have something else. <laughs> um, but um, let's see, so I thought, you know, if I'm an English major, I should be a writer. Um, so um, I jumped into the publishing world and immediately became an editorial assistant. Um, to which I realized I could not make a living. Um, it was um, about $24,000 a year to start, and I said this was not exactly where I wanted to be. Um, it was also just not very challenging. It was a lot of editing, and I wasn't actually doing any writing myself. Um, so one day, this woman came in to um, host some kind of a seminar, and immediately, she was a man in management consultant, and immediately I was like, oh, I want to try that. Um, so I went home that day and I wrote a program that I thought she should deliver. It was very, I don't know what it said. Um, but it, it, was, it was a program with, you know, people's different personality traits and how to work with them in the workplace. Um, and I took her out to lunch at Stephanie's on Newberry. And I said, I really want to work for you. I don't know what I want to be. Um, and she said, sure. So I worked with her for a year. And um, it was it went okay. It was again. It wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. I have a little bit of an unconventional career. Sorry, um, 
But so, oh, I know what happened. So I started pitching her for speaking engagements, and I realized this, there was this whole world called public relations, which I hadn't heard of being an English major. Being an English major, so um, I started researching what public relations professionals did. Um, I literally went to Barnes and Nobles and bought um, PR for dummies, and I sat in the Barnes and Nobles and I read the whole thing and went into a PR firm to try to get a job. Um, and I, I, I got a job. I started out as account executive. <laughs> Sorry, this it's, is <laughs> this is real life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, I started as an account executive or an assistant account executive at a PR firm, a tech PR firm, and that's actually where I actually found my passion was doing marketing and PR for technology companies. I worked there for a while. I loved it, and um, eventually I was looking through LinkedIn, and I said, well, now that I have the agency experience, I want to look to see if I could work in-house as a PR manager. Um, so I looked on LinkedIn and I saw a couple of job listings and one of them said, you know, content manager. Um, and, but underneath the job listing they had PR requirements, so I thought that was a little bit odd. Um, but anyway, I, I sent them my resume, um, I went in for an interview and he's like, well, this is really a content marketing position with a few PR um, tasks or, or duties. And, I was like, well, why do, I think you need a PR manager. Why don't you bring on both a content manager and a PR manager? And you know, after negotiating over a few things, he finally agreed that you need both. So I became the PR manager of this software as a services company, and um, I loved that too. And um, I eventually decided I wanted to start a family. So um, stepping out of that rat race was the right decision for me for a little while. So I started my own consulting firm um, with another woman, and we built up clients, technology clients. Um, it, it worked for six years, and that's where I am now. So Mobius Inc. It's not always a direct shot. <laughs> <laughs> I took the least direct shot, but that's why your career is going to be very interesting, yeah, right? The so, other side of the coin. Exactly. So, um, that's a ton. Nice to see everybody. Um, so I started, I went, as I mentioned, went to Cornell to the hotel school. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, Liz and I are actually, or Professor Wolf, as I should say, are actually college roommates. So we've known each other for a long time. But um, I uh, ended up at Cornell, I pretty much was looking at undergraduate business programs and kind of stumbled upon the hotel school and the more I learned about it, I was like, this is a pretty cool industry. And it just fit me. Um, so, you know, my, my experience in college was very much a management background, uh, but we had specialties in the hospitality industry, and I got in with Marriott to do a summer internship as a junior, and um, kind of never looked back. So I interned with Marriott two summers during college, and was hired my senior year, and I've been with Marriott for 17 years. So um, if you would ask me back then if I'd ever be for, with a company that long, um, especially in our generation, you don't hear that very often anymore. Um, but I've been very blessed. The hotel has grown. The company has grown and changed, you know, a tremendous amount over the years. And I've had a lot of different roles um, in the organization. And I said they haven't given me a reason to leave. So it's really a company that takes great care of their employees. And um, you know, I've always been in the world of sales. Um, I have been kind of every different discipline of sales, uh, but that's just where my passion is. Um, I started on property, I've worked, you know, I did a lot of the sort of social catering side of things, group business, um, I did citywide sales with our big like annual conventions, came in with convention centers, um, you know, working closely with the cities to get business to come their way. Um, I've done a lot of account management positions um, throughout the years and kind of being that central point of contact for Marriott. Um, and then I went into the world of leadership for a few years, um, always thought I wanted to be a leader, learned a lot realized there were certain parts of leadership that I liked and certain parts of leadership that I didn't like so much. Um, and, you know, same as Jenny, I have two little kids, and so the flexibility um, to work remote and to you know, travel a lot, on the road a lot. Um, but I stepped out of leadership a few years ago, took a job on our global sales organization, which was a position that, you know, as a newbie to Marriott, was like, oh, if I can ever get to that team. Um, so it was pretty awesome when I was able to get a role. I actually took over for someone who retired and been in the job for 18 years. So um, you really do have to be patient and wait for a position sometimes. But um, so now, I, I, as I mentioned, I manage about uh, 55 or 60 accounts 
and really my day-to-day -day is managing relationships. Um, it's a long-term sell, it's a long-term partnership. Um, I spend a lot of time just finding opportunities to stay in front of my customers and be their advocate. And I play that middleman between the hotels and the client. Um, I'd like to say that everything always goes right, but it doesn't. And I spend a lot of my time um, putting out fires, for lack of a better word, but um, you know, again, it's the loyalty, it's the relationship, and we're in it for the long haul. So, um, so that's kind of my world now, and um, you know, like I said, the rest is to come. So, thank you for having us. Thank you for sharing your career journeys. Um, so, Mandy and I have a couple of questions to ask, and we'll move forward to the audience. Sure. So, the first question is there something you wish you would have known before entering the workforce? I have something to share. Yeah, I'll yeah. jump in. Um, we got these questions ahead of time, so we got a chance to think a little bit about it. But um, I think the one thing that that came to mind for me is I think when you're fresh starting out, it would have been nice for someone to kind of say, you know what, it's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to like take a leap and fail. You know, I think when you're first starting out, you're just you're so you're building that reputation and kind of your perception with everybody. Just everyone, you want everything to be perfect and follow the rules and do everything. And I think because of that, you don't necessarily go for certain opportunities. And, you know, I think over the years, there's been things that I'm like, oh, I don't know, I'm probably not ready for that. And so, but the, the times that I have taken a leap have been my greatest, I mean, had the greatest impact on my career. Be it because I got to work for somebody that was just an incredible mentor, or I developed a skill in an area that I never really realized was important, but it springboarded me to get the next job. Um, so I think to know that like you can try something and not be 100% perfect at it. And, um, and I think on that same thing I've learned over the years, it's okay not to have an answer. You know, if you go in somewhere and a customer is asking you all these things and, you know, I think earlier in my career I probably would make up an answer before I said I didn't know the answer. And, um, and I think that as I got further along, I think people, they want to work with people they trust and they know do a good job. And so it's okay. I'm not, I can't know everything. So, you know, for, there's times where I go to an appointment and of course I, you know, I heard the knowledge that I have, which some days is probably more impactful than others, but um, but some days I'm like, you know, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'll get back to you. And then I do, and if you have, you just have to make sure you follow through and do those things. So, you know, I think those are some of the things that um, comes with time. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, Kind of building off of that point, the risk, the risk thing. I think women in particular tend to be more risk averse. Um, we second guess ourselves when, like, say, a job posting, we don't meet 100 percent of the qualifications. Maybe we meet 50 percent or 60 percent or even 80 percent, and we're like, well, I don't meet this one, so I don't think I'm going to apply. Um, um, taking taking some risk is a good thing, and will probably give you. Some of your most your best opportunities and, and your most memorable opportunities. I think um, knowing that, knowing that you tend toward being a woman, that I might tend to, to take a less uh, risky, make a less risky decision, um, will kind of push me, being conscious of my bias, being push me in the other direction. Say, no, I really should try this, um, and having a little bit more confidence in in that decision. So uh, yeah, I would agree with what you said. Just to piggyback off of that, you know, fake it till you make it is real. Yeah. Like, like so you you can do that. It's okay to fake it till you make it. But once you're not faking it anymore and you've made it, you have to acknowledge that in yourself. Yeah. Because that's something that happened to me. I I was faking it until I make. I mean, you heard my journey. I was faking it so much <laughs> that when I finally did make it and I had the skills and I had the expertise, that I still thought I was faking it. You guys probably know that as imposter syndrome. But it is real. It is real. Yeah, <laughs> and and so I, I think it's important to fake it until you make it to go for those job opportunities where you have eighty percent of the requirements. Um, but it's also important that when you have made it to own that, and that's the way you rise to, to become a leader in the organization. Because if you don't own that and let people know that you know how to do this stuff now, nobody's going to notice you. Nobody is going to find you. Don't wait for it to come to you. You have to do it yourself. Put yourself out there. Um, I think it's important. To have some confidence in your ability to learn the skills that you might not have 100% grasp on. Like you, you might not know how to do something, but you can say, gosh, I learned really quick, and I, I know I can pick that up really fast. And I have this, this and this skill, and 
I, I can definitely do this. Um, just have some confidence. Well, I always used to say, too, that you, know, you take different jobs for different roles in your life. I mean, sometimes you make a lateral move for whatever reason it is. But I always say that if you take an upward movement and it's not hard when you start, you probably didn't make a big enough jump. You know, you, you're, you need to challenge your brain or you need to, you know, for me, I think times where I knew it was time for me to go for another job was when I felt my learning curve just drastically dropped. And, um, you know, to have that opportunity to, like, challenge your brain and learn a new skill and, you know, whatever it might be. So I think that you want to push yourself to do that because, then again, it's just going to impact you further down the line. Thank you. Um, our next question is, what do you think is the most significant barrier to female Exactly. It's yeah. it's taking the Not risks. Risk. It's believing in yourself. Um, it's it's being scared and still going for it. Feeling uncomfortable and still going for it. Like this makes me very uncomfortable, but I am here. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it is. And if you have to have that mentor or somebody help you through that, or a friend, you know what I mean. I mean, just. Right. But yeah, taking those chances. I think I think we are our worst. Yes. Yes. Um, the next question, do you find it hard to achieve work-life balance, and how do you achieve work-life balance? <laughs> well, we all work from the perspective of having kids. Like, well, I'm very fortunate I work from home. Um, I travel probably once or twice a month, um, but I do my office, so if I'm not on the road, my office is in my house. So it definitely helps, you know, to have that work-life balance. Um, my boys are 10 and 12. So, you know, constant activity, thousand things going on. There's a lot of distractions, which is another, you know, thing to work out. But, you know, for me, work-life balance isn't just being mom. Um, you know, I think taking care of yourself is also a part of that. And, um, you know, I think very fortunately, because I do work from home, you know, like working out for me is very important. And that's always something that can quickly go out of your schedule. I schedule it, like, in my day. It's blocked on my calendar, and Liz is laughing at me because she knows my type A personality from many, many years ago. Um, but um, but I do. I mean, it's not going to change it if something really important comes up. But if someone's like, "Oh, can we connect to ten? and I'm like, "You know, it's really good. Like spin class." I don't I say I don't tell them about the spin class, but you know, I have it blocked on my calendar to be that way. So because I know I'm a better person for going to that class. You know, I'm more effective. You know, I'll come back. I'm like dial in. I'm ready to go. So. You know, I think that with technology nowadays, the greatest part about that is that we can be flexible with scheduling the hours that we work. You know, I might dial in for an hour in the morning, take a break for an hour, get my kids off to school, and then dial back in. Um, but I might be back on my laptop at 9 o'clock at night, um, catching up on some of the things that I didn't do for that hour during the day. So, you know, I think that it's, you strike the balance. I'm in sales, so I have a number I have to reach by the end of the year. So, you know, I'm, I have an accountability factor, you know, very black and white for me. Um, and, you know, my boss isn't really looking for me. You know, as long as I'm making that number, you know, I'm running my own little business and my own accounts. So, you know, no one's going to tell you, get up and go take a walk or do whatever or, you know, take care of yourself. You could sit at that desk for 10 hours and eat bad food and do all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's, it's a challenge, but I think to be able to it be okay with the fact that taking care of yourself is important is, you know, getting your job done. Because um, it will make you better. You'll, you'll call it sick. You you know, those sorts of things. It'll make you happier. Um, you won't burn out as fast and stuff. So, you know, it's taken me, you know, over the years to get used to that, but I think it's definitely um, helped me be more successful. I mean, I was going to say, I've been trying to get better at saying no to things. Yeah, no, um, I, you know, I, try, I definitely schedule a workout time and, and things that I, I'm a musician, I love to play music, and so I know that that makes me more balanced as a, as a person for me. Um, so I like to have time to do that every day. Um, and then I also I just have to, even though it sounds really exciting, sometimes I have to say no because I know for my well-being and, and um, my time that it's just not going to happen, even though I really want to do it. I would have to go back to your previous question that flexibility is awesome, but sometimes it does hurt you, um, especially when I when I was when I had my first son. Um, I wanted flexibility so badly that I did stop going up the ladder, in a sense. Like, I, I stepped out of the, the, the world, and I'm, well, I started my own consulting firm, but it is definitely a little different when you're on the outside than on the inside, and I think that that want for flexibility also kind of stalls you a little bit, um, and you should watch out for it, because 
you don't just like just like Betsy said, I mean, you can still have flexibility. You shouldn't think you can't have flexibility before you've even asked. <laughs> like that assumption will hold you back. Um, because um, you know, you can leave at a certain time if after you put your kids to bed you get back on, right? And you answer the few emails you need to answer. Um, you can go to the gym. You know, I actually I was laughing because um, Professor Volpe and I <laughs> go to this gym class and sometimes we see this woman on a conference call <laughs> and she's literally, bus, she's literally lifting and then all of a sudden she's like, excuse me, she puts her barbell down, she oh goes God. outside and she answers I can get to you. <laughs> and, she, and she comes wow. back in. I saw a woman with a laptop on her step just like making sure she was, you know, so I mean, you can do it. You just have to be a little more creative, but you don't have to stop. You also have to earn it too, though. I think that's the other good thing. Is that, you know, you don't get that day one of walking into right. a job. That's true. You need to know that. Like when you, you know, you have to, you have to earn your place. You have to know that you're a good worker. I mean, I didn't get to work from home the first year I worked for Marriott. I mean, I worked in the hotels for many years and created those relationships. And you know, our world has changed a lot. Technology has changed a whole lot. Um, you know, to allow us to do these things, but. Know, because you're not in front of your boss every day, you have to find other ways for them to know that you're doing a good job. I mean, it's, it's self promotion. It's you know, you need to be able to say, you know, guess what I did? Like this huge sale I just had, or whatever it might be. Because it's um, you know, because of the you lose that personal connection to some degree, you have to do other things. So um, you know, I agree. I think it's you have to find other ways to maintain that. Um, but you know, I think you just you need to do a good job, and then then ask the question. You know, yeah. can I work home one day a week, or can I leave at three o'clock because I'm playing a soccer league and I really want to make the game? So you don't be just because you have kids. I mean, it could be yeah. for music or passion, yeah. whatever it might be. Um, you know, everybody's life is important for whatever reason it's important to you. She's a she's a business owner. She's a woman. She's got a woman-owned business, um, but she has had the entire time I've been alive, pretty much. And my dad stayed home with us a lot, so she's been a great role model as far as um, kind of empowering me and to take charge of my career and figuring out what my passions are. Um, so she's always been my role model. But um, I just got back from a great conference, Society of Women Engineers, with a, a group of eleven students, and I just found it so inspiring to be in a group. Typically when I go to conferences, just to give you a picture, I look around a room of 100 people and there are maybe three females in the room <laughs> under the age of 50. And so you stand you out like a sore thumb. <laughs> <laughs> you stand out, you just can't help it. And um, I got back from this, from this conference, or at this conference, I'm looking around and there's 12,000 women at this conference, all engineers, and I was like, wow, this is just so inspiring. Like I feel so inspired just sitting in a room with all these people that are all sorts of generations and um, you know on all these different career paths but are managing you know lots of different things in their in their lives they're excited about their jobs in engineering and they've also got families and um, you know their work life balance um, um, so I'm inspired by that by other women. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, I kind of you know I feel like Cheryl Sandberg nailed it with Lean In, but um, my biggest female inspiration is my grandmother, just hands down. Um, she emigrated from Cuba in the 60s, um, and talk about taking risks. <laughs> Took her whole family to the United States to you know, have a better life. Um, and she worked when women didn't work, and she, she rose when women didn't rise, and um, she fought for herself and she fought for her family, and um, I and have a better inspiration, I think. So that's cool. Should have done. Um, I think when I started thinking about it, I was like, who have I been inspired by? I think, you know, strong, confident women in general, but the ones that also find a way to, like, have a little bit of grace. You know, we all have the stereotypical females that rise to the top and, you know, kind of have this hard exterior shell about them. And my team kind of rags on me sometimes. It's sort of a little warm and fuzzy, but, you know, it's like... You don't have to be, you can be a genuinely 
good, nice person. You can care about the people that work for you. And, you know, I, I have worked for all sorts of different leaders over the years, and I think you take a lot from your different bosses, either what you don't want to be or what you do want to be. Um, and, you know, I think about the women that I've, you know, followed through Marriott's like that. They're the ones that, like, get the human element as well. You know, don't get me wrong. They have the difficult conversations. They'll tell you when you're out of line. You know, they'll push you in certain areas. But, you know, where is there the opportunity to, like, just care about that person, you know? And so, I don't know. I start to think about who, who is that? Like, who do I think of, and, like, in the world? And, like, I think, like, Michelle Obama. Like, I've always just thought she was, regardless of what your political affiliations are, just a cool lady, you know, like really powerful, like presents herself really well, clearly has a really great family situation. And um, the other one that came to mind was Robin Roberts from Good Morning America. Like, you know, again, just somebody that really cares about who they are, but they seem like good people. I mean, maybe they're not behind the scenes, I don't know. Certainly they're not in my inner circle. But, um, so anyways, that's good. That was kind of what I thought about it. So. Thank you. Um, have you used any setbacks in your career that you think I, I can I can be honest. <laughs> Go for I it. faced a, a big setback when I um, announced that I was pregnant. Um, I was almost immediately demoted, and somebody was hired above me. Even though I started the company with these gentlemen, and um, basically with ten people on one table, and um, it grew to. Um, 250, 350 people. So it was um, it was a hard one. <laughs> um, but the way that I dealt with it is I said, well, if you're not going to promote me, I'm going to promote myself. <laughs> and I started my own company. And it turns out that that was the best thing I ever did because I did give myself more flexibility. And it did allow me to be around more. And I've been doing it for six years. And it business it's been booming business it's um, it really I've grown a lot and I've learned a lot but it was definitely I was pushed into it a bit by my situation um, but um, I think that the lesson here again is not to wait for it to come to you I could have stayed in that company and watched somebody rise above me but instead I chose to seek out another opportunity um, and I think that is how you keep rising. That's how we're going to get more women leaders in the world, is not to be stagnated by the fact that somebody doesn't agree with your choice at the time, um, but to keep going. So I think that's been my biggest challenge so far in my career. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be the last time. <laughs> so, it all happens. Yeah. I can think, too, about four years ago, I went for a job on the mobile sales team. Role that I'm in now, and you know, never prepared harder for an interview. Um, ultimately, didn't get the job. I made it to one of the final rounds to get the job. And you know, there's been you know, there's been a lot of jobs over the years I haven't gotten. But again, that also speaks to going for opportunities that maybe you know, maybe it was reach, you know, or it might be. And you know, the thing that I took away from it was um, I really I, I I spent time with the interviewer afterwards. Like, why? You know, what was it about the other person, or what was it about me that was missing? Or, and that feedback is so incredibly valuable. Um, you know, they said to me, you don't have a lot of leadership experience. And so what did I do? I went and got a leadership job. And, um, you know, they shared a few other things with me, and so I went, I went to the leap, and I went back to the office. I was a huge, I worked for remote for like eight years, so I went back to the leadership job in the city, started commuting again, and doing all that, which kind of rocked my world. But you figure it out. And, um, and I did this job for a couple of years, and as part of that, I got nominated to be part of this Emerging Leaders Program at Marriott. They gave me a ton of exposure, and they were challenged to move those people through the organization. So they had an incentive to get us you know, promoted along. And had I never not gotten that job, I never would have gotten into this Emerging Leaders Program and gotten exposure with people. And ultimately, I'm convinced that I got the job the second go around because I followed the advice of the person before. Um, and actually, I think I was much better prepared for the job the second time around because I'd been in a leadership job and had the opportunity to have those difficult conversations and worked with a lot of stakeholders and owners. And, you know, the accounts that I handle are our top accounts and company, and their expectations are really 
high. And when we screw up, like, it's a big deal. These are multi-million dollar accounts. Um, so anyways, I think, you know, there's times when you're not going to get jobs. And anybody you, look, anybody you talk to in any corporate America has gone for jobs we have not. Um, you know, it's, I don't think it's necessarily that you're not the right person. It's just somebody else is a little bit better. So, kind of going along with what um, what was said before about risk. With, with taking risks, it comes a lot of failures. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of little failures all the time that happen. You know, for me, applying to <laughs> applying to jobs or applying or sending out. Um, yeah, I have to do publications. So you submit a journal article to a, to get reviewed, and you get rejected. And I remember the first rejection I got, I took it so personally. I was like so upset about it. You know, like they critique it, they write all the comments of what was wrong and um, the logic. You know, this is right. Like I just spent three years writing this journal paper, and then it was torn apart. Um, but the more you, you you get, you just get used to it. And you uh, you take the things from it and make it better. So like. Yep. You said it's, it's an opportunity to take the criticism and learn from the criticism and make changes and make it even better. And you, you just can't let it, um, can't get bogged down with taking it personally or um, not being afraid to take the risk in the first place for fear of rejection. Because you're, it's just going to happen over and over again, um, more so than the successes, really. Um, when was the last time you were criticized and how did you deal with it? <laughs> Um, okay, so I guess I can go. <laughs> um, I, I had a, well, someone uh, come sit into my class and give me a critique of my class and criticisms of my class. Um, and so that's something that happens a lot, that being a, being a teacher. Um, and what I like to do whenever I get criticism, that's just one example, um, could be a journal article, could be something else. I, um, you know, try to listen to it, try to just be open and accept all the things that have that are said, even that if you might disagree with something or um, might agree with something. Um, and then I, I spend a lot of time writing things down. I keep a journal. Um, um, so I find it really helpful for me processing to write down criticisms and kind of sort through them. And I end up kind of coming to conclusions about them and figuring out what are the tangible things that I can actually do moving forward. Um, so writing for me helps me process I'm trying to think, when I was a leader for a number of years, we used to do these 360 reviews, and you would get um, a leader, a peer, a number of peers, and some direct reports would report on you. It's pretty daunting to get a report on yourself. I mean, you know what you're good at. I mean, it's, there's no real major surprise what you're good at and what you need to work on. But then we see it in print, and we're like, yeah. all right, because it's officially <laughs> that is the case. And, you know, I think that I've learned over the years that, like, you cannot be good at everything. You know, I was in this leadership job, and I consider myself a great salesperson, and, you know, a mentor, and a strategizer. There's a lot of like financial stuff. And for me, I'm that's just not. I'm not as you know financially minded. I married one of those, but um, you know. So the thing that I've learned over the years is where do you find somebody to compliment those skills? So you know, and I found that you know, I had um, a peer in my last role that was a leader of another team, and that was like her forte. And I would sit with her, and I'd be like, Can you just help me, like? I had a really hard time with, like, data storytelling, you know, like, taking an Excel worksheet and figuring out how to, like, stand up in front of an order presentation and really say it in a way that I was comfortable. Um, I could fake it till I make it, you know, talking about other things or whatever, but that was an area where I really struggled. And, um, and she, she really helped me. I mean, we would go through presentations together ahead of time, and we would do those sorts of things. And um, so, you know, I think that, you know, taking critique is really important. But there's certain areas you're only going to get so good at, you know, and you have to be okay with that. You know, you know, you may you may have heard of like public speaking, and you can take public speaking classes, and you can get better at it. It still may never feel comfortable to you. So I think that you know, if there's an opportunity for you to surround yourself with people um, who can complement those skills, um, I think that that's where you get most successful because, you know, ultimately. You know, I can spend so much time on those things, and yeah, I can fake my way through it and probably do okay, but somebody else is going to do it better. So that's kind of what I've learned over the years. And that's an attribute of a good leader, right? Knowing who does it better, right? And holding them up. And being fine with it. Yeah, yeah. let yeah. them get the recognition for it. It's fine. Yeah. Um, so I guess 
putting your own business puts you in a really good spot. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I can remember, I can remember a time in agency. Agency, peer agencies can be slightly brutal, um, and you really get some thick skin. Um, but I remember um, kind of coming in, and um, so I come from a Cuban family, very loud and boisterous, and joking a lot, and. Sometimes that doesn't really fit in with um, the culture, or 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 where you're misunderstood a lot. So I think that was my first critique was, you know, you are you're you don't know it, but you're hurting somebody's feelings, and it was a tough one for me because, um, of course, that wasn't my intention, um, but I definitely had to tone down a little bit and and. You know, I don't even resent saying this. It's not you're not toning down your culture, but you're knowing your audience. You know, you're you you've got to know your audience, and you know you can go back home and be that person and be. You know, we like to make fun of each other. That's not great in the workplace, as I found out. <laughs> so, so um, you know, know your audience. You know, you're in New England. You're in the workplace. It's totally different than when you're in Miami. Place, apparently. And, um, it's a, but you know what? I, like picture I know. It's, like, yeah, it's kind of a transition, you know? But, you know, the more you learn who your audience is and you know how to speak to them, it, you that's how you accomplish your goals. That's how you get things done. If you're speaking a different language, um, even if you're speaking the same language, um, you know, you're misunderstood. Um, just communication is lost, so I would just counsel everybody to know who you're talking to. Sure. The last question that I have is, what advice would you give a young woman who wants to succeed in the workplace? I find, uh, find multiple mentors, um, people in all sorts of paths of, on their, of their careers and um, you know different experiences in their careers. Um, and also your peers being great mentors. You know, I've got like 10 different mentors, just people I go to for, for various things. And some people are, are better at certain things than others, or some people give great advice about X and not Y. Um, so that, that's my advice, find, find people. And they can be men for, for women, they can be women and men. Some of the best mentors I've had have been men for me, so. Because there's not a lot. But there's not a lot of women mentors. Yeah, I mean, especially in your world. There's a lot of women But I, I, I find that too. It's yeah. hard for me to say who's my inspiration when I don't have a lot of women that I work with. Yeah. Um, I would say um, just you know go for it if you want something, go for it. Um, support it with the work that you've already done. You know when you go into your your interviews, you know show them what you can do, your skills. Sometimes bring in something you know physical that you can show them. Um, don't hold back. Take risks. You're gonna fail, but one day you're gonna succeed, and all those failures are gonna be worth it. I just think we want to get your hands dirty. Um, you know, I think that you just gotta get in there and just do it. Um, you know, I think that I remember coming out of college, and certain people were like, I don't want that job. I just graduated from college. You know, sometimes you gotta take that entry level position just to get into a company. Um, you know, be an admin for six months or a year or whatever it may. That may seem like so long, but it's a blip on the radar screen when you look at your career. And, you know, sometimes you just need to get your foot in the door. And you guys have all heard that before, but it really is the case. And then they, as soon as they see, oh, this person's really good, the work ethic is great, or whatever, you know, be okay to take something that, you know, it might seem like it's slightly beneath you. Um, but, you know, I talked to any executive at the company. Most of them started as bellmen or line cooks or, you know, whatever. But I think, to have perspective in different aspects of your industry is really important too. So, you know, like for my world, like, yeah, I've been in sales, you know, majority of my career, um, really my whole career, but I have dabbled in other areas. And I think you appreciate, you know, like how's telling you, Street, it's cogs in the wheel. I mean, it's just, if one thing's not working well, the overall service experience for the guest is gonna, it's at some point's gonna break down. So, you know, I always say diversify your resume as much as you can. Um, you know, be it within your industry or, you know, opportunities to build new skills, know what you're weak at, or find opportunities to, to tweak it and make it better. So, um, you know, I think that those are, um, you know, 
you know, in the beginning, you just got to be open to opportunities. Thank you so much for answering our questions. Yeah. Um, you guys want to wear something. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Do we want to open that yeah, why don't we open it up to questions from the audience? Does anybody in the audience have any questions for the panelists? Somebody has some questions. Jenny. Um, do you guys wish that you guys had like more female mentors like in your careers or like think that you'll eventually mentor people as you go to the place? Yeah, I'm sort of unique because in the hospitality industry I'm surrounded by him. Although ironically though in Marriott, still our highest level, you know, C level, you know, are primarily male. Um, which they're trying to change. Um, so I've had a lot of strong women leaders that I can. But it's been it's been great now, like you know, doing what we're doing, finally being able to kind of give back, um, you know, starting to be able to help other people on their journey. Um, I don't feel like it's been that long since we started, but I guess the years are going by quickly. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really gratifying to be able to give back because there were a lot of people that helped me along the way, um, and I think that those things are super important. Yeah, I think engineering and tech have a long way to go. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't. <laughs> that I can actually say, like, can you help me? Or, I mean, I haven't run into that yet. Um, that's why I find Cheryl Sandberg so awesome. She's the CEO of Facebook. You know, she's, I, I felt like I was looking into a mirror when I read her book because it just did feel that way. It, it never felt like I had somebody, well, I mean, like, there are good men mentors. I mean, there are. Yep. Um, and you shouldn't shy away from that. Find your different perspectives. Yeah, sometimes. exactly. And sometimes they can help you even more in our careers. Um, so you never know. But yeah, I wish there were more. I hope to be one one day. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, definitely wish there were more. Um, it was kind of a shock to me actually get, get, getting out of my undergraduate degree and, and getting more into the, the further along you get in your field in engineering and probably other disciplines, the women kind of drop out. Um, yep. And so going to a conference and sitting in a room of, of you know three women and a group of 100 men, and you have this feeling like, do I even belong here? <laughs> um, you know, even though you, you think you do, but you know, subconsciously you're you're surrounded by all the people that don't look like you. Um, and uh, so definitely, the the with the older women and the women that have more experience, they tend to get all the the women with that with the um, coming into the the workforce, they're gravitating towards them because they see, oh, this is one person that you know I can go to with these things. So they've got that kind of burden on them because they're like the one mentor for you know all these these twenty women that just showed up in the room. You're the token um, woman. Yeah. You're the token woman. Yeah. Um, but uh, hopefully that changes. You know um, that they're the, the population of women in, in tech is growing slowly. Um, and, you know if we keep them there, then they'll be there for for generations coming up. So yes, I do wish there were more. But you make the best of it and you try to. Try to stick it out and use your peers. That's important. Other questions? Oh, Fred. So, talk about like the diversity someone would face in the workplace because of the glass ceiling, or now it's called the ladder. Can you just talk a little about some of the diversity you would face off of your past? With being a woman in the workplace? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I think my path has definitely been a labyrinth. It's and it's it's funny because I can I, I agree it's, there's not a glass ceiling. I think you can get there, but to get there it is not a straight path. Yeah. Um, the but, career paths are totally different. Though. Yeah, you yeah. Have different needs yep. and you want to fulfill those needs like flexibility. So you jump out and then you jump back in. And I mean there's there's a there it is it is a it is achievable for sure, but it is not a straight path. My big thing I learned over the years, too, is don't assume what people think of you. So, you know, I was a mom with two little kids, and a lot of people were like, you know, she's happy where she is, you know, she's content, let's let her run on auto autopilot for a while. And don't get me wrong, there were times in my career where I absolutely was content to be on autopilot, and because I had so many other things going on personally. But if you don't, you know, perception's reality, right? So um, I made sure that I still was sharing with my leaders, you know what, I'm interested in getting here, I want to do this, I want to work on these things. Because I think there were a lot of male leaders, probably I don't even just say male, there were leaders who were just made assumptions about me because I was a mom. 
Um, and those that was an area where I bet you, you know, I bet you that if I didn't say those things that I wouldn't even have been thought of for certain promotions. Um, so you do have to raise your hand, you know, you do have to sort of fight your own fight. I think you said it earlier, no one's gonna come to you with the perfect opportunity. Like you have to create your opportunity. Um, like even that leadership job that I took, I was like, you know what, I'll come back in the city. I was like, I can't do it five days a week. And I negotiated, I'm like, can I work home two days a week? Can I do something different? You know, you know, can I flex this a little bit? So, you know, I think again, it's just you have to raise your hand and you have to um, fight for yourself. Um, and sometimes women have to do it a little bit more than, than men. Um, so other questions? I have a question. Yes, a question. Yes, okay. So um, you know, we've talked a lot about in class and Jenny references in her book. And one of the things she talks a lot about is the role of a significant other or a partner. So can you talk a little bit about the influence that you perceive your partners have had on your own career journey in, in any way, shape, or form? I know, I know for engineering, it's very typical that women engineers are also married to other engineers. I don't know how that happens, but um, it seems to be very common. Um, and uh, I think that your your partner or in your relations in your relationships or, or you know whoever you're with, um, it's really important that both people. If, if the woman is trying to you know, rise up in a leadership position and further her career, that the partner is equally supportive of that and you work as a, as a team unit. And I can't say enough about my, you know, my husband being super supportive of my career um, the whole time. And it's, you know, it's give and take and there's compromises here and then there's compromises there. Um, if your partner is not, is not supportive, then it's going to make it a lot more challenging. So it's, it's good to put a lot of thought into that person. Yeah, we were talking about this earlier. Yeah. I was saying, like, you know, one, I think my husband, my husband's in the financial world, so he's in that rat race, you know, he's been in it forever, and he owns his own consulting firm now, but he worked for a lot of the big banks, and he was the one who would be like, why are you going for that? Why are you asking for money? For money? Why are you not, you know, doing those things? Because he came from that world, you know, so there were times when he was a really good reality check for me, um, which was great, and then I think there were times where we were like, how do we make this work? There's no way, if I take this job, and we're going to be able to handle the kids, or, you know, life, or whatever, and he'd be like, figure it out. Like, if we have to hire somebody or if we have to do whatever, you know, we're doing dual incomes, we can make it work. So I think it was like the voice of reason sometimes because I can overthink things. Um, so I don't know, it's been, that's definitely been an area that over the years it's been nice to have somebody kind of just level set me. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and I mean, even it comes down to logistics sometimes. Like, you go to work at 6 a.m., you know, so I'll take care of the kids, um, I'll do breakfast, you do dinner, you know, so that. I mean, it works out for us because most of my clients are in Silicon Valley, so they don't wake up until, what, like noon here. So I take the morning and work till 8, and he takes the evening. But if you don't have that help, I don't know how it's possible. It's, um, it, yeah, you, you need somebody to be there for you, to support you. I love your examples of him telling you to go for it. Because my husband does the same thing. He's like, why are you still thinking about this? Like, just say yes. So, I'm you know, it is it is helpful to have that voice because so often we question ourselves, um, but it's also helpful tactically and logistically to get stuff done and to take turns. You know, and sometimes you feel like ships crossing in the night. And that's another whole question yeah, about your flight delayed. Your all yeah. plans gonna blow up. Exactly, right. exactly. But you really, it, a partner is important for sure. That you have kids, and actually, if you don't. Sorry. <laughs> and I should have said that, that. Yeah. yeah. No, well, you know, right. Right. Anything. Yeah. The dog takes more attention than my kids do some days. Anybody else? And yeah, Josh. Um, one question that we talk about a lot in principal class is how do we achieve equal, equal representation of women, especially in the upper management, C level suites, like you mentioned. You're working more around women in your industry, yet at the C level suite, you still see a lot higher representation. Um, so there, are there anything that you guys think that can practically be put in, maybe in your specific fields, to help grow representation of women in upper management? Yeah, so... Sorry, I'm going to interpret, okay, Josh? We talk a lot about the class. We know this, there's this big, this leadership divide, and, you know, the students are 
she as Bessie pointed out, she may work around a lot of women at, at, at various levels. But when you look at the C-suites at Marriott, when you look at the top people in the Silicon Valley and engineering, it's still mostly male population. So what are some practical things? How can we, what are some actual tangible things um, that we can talk about just in practice and, and what practices can be implemented, whether they be organizational practices or macro societal practices to help achieve a, a more parity? How do we make those changes? I think first stop when you said like these women conferences, like Marriott runs this women leadership conference every year, and it's just about women. And it's like, you know, where are there the opportunities or how do we drive it home? So I think the more that we magnify that there is that is that is an issue. I mean, eventually those C level people are gonna retire and the next generation is gonna come in, right? So, you know, the more that we talk about it, we push people into roles and um, create those right mentors and stuff like that. I think just for the longest time that was just the way we did things. And um, so I think that, um, and I know for me, being able to watch some of these, being part of some of these like, women leadership, like I'm first sure for you at your, you know, women in engineering, you know, that, that power. So, I mean, I don't know if I know exactly what the answer is, but, you know, I think that we're much more aware of it than we ever were before. Um, I don't know, I'm a little yeah. insightful answer for that. I don't know if anybody else to share. I think um, from a couple things, I think peers, you mentioned peers. Um, um, peer mentoring groups, peer um, like peer to peer has has been shown to be very effective to have groups that are kind of on the same maybe that entered in at the same time or similar times to have to be able to, to meet and talk to one another and kind of troubleshoot things in the workplace together has been shown to be very effective. Um, and even having um, peer or not, not peer um, like mentors that are know in leadership positions can also help so kind of both of those cross and then up um, have been trying to be really effective um, also I think policies um, just like parental leave policies for example is a really big one I don't have kids but I you know I, I see that um, the companies that have the parental leave policies where both the men and the women can take time off for for, for family reasons makes it a little bit more of a level playing field because um, then you know the the men are also taking time away from the job too, and um, you know the women have to take time away from the job. But um, I just think that's effective too. So policies. Um, I just I wonder how we get rid of the stigma of having a child and thinking that that woman will no longer be yeah. useful to us. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that that still right off the that's true. It just still it still exists. Um, I when I had my second when I had my daughter. I had my own company and she was home with me and after two weeks I just I was kind of bored honestly and I was like I'm just gonna start working like I'm bored <laughs> so after two weeks she's home with me I'm still taking care of her and playing with her but I'm also using my brain and getting something done um, you know people don't know about that like people don't know about that stuff but actually some women do want to keep doing something on the side or you know some women don't and that's okay because eventually they'll get back into it um, I just, that stigma, if there is some way to erase it, because it really isn't true. I mean, a lot of women have babies and want to go back to work. <laughs> it, it's, it's very right. Yeah. Love my kids. I always have a better mother because I yeah. go work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, isn't there a stat that women in the 70s who stayed at home spend the same amount of time with their kids as yeah. we do? Working mothers today. Yeah, working mothers today. 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 Working Mom, and I think that you know we have a lot to give, you know. So I think it's um, it's great to see that women are starting to rise up to different ranks because you know there's certain things that men do really well, and there's certain things that women do really well. And I think that those characteristics both need to be in the C-suite um, for a company ultimately to be successful. I thought of oh, go ahead. No, and companies are more successful when they have both. Yeah, yeah. I thought of one more thing too um, because it's related to kind of my husband and. and and I guess this hasn't really been touched on, but what is men's role in, in this? And I see a lot of men in the audience. Um, and, and my husband, who, you know, I talk to him a lot about women's issues and, you know, stuff in the workplace, just because I'm really interested in it. But, but because of that, he has become more aware of things that happen in the workplace. And so when, you 
you know, an instance does come up, you know, in the conference room where somebody says something that might be a little bit inappropriate or someone doesn't get promoted, he recognizes it and uh, he sees it being, uh, you know, on the, on the younger end of the employees um, can, you know, when he's transitioning into management positions, can help lead that change and help call out some of those things. Um, so there are, there are generational differences and I think it, um, advocating advocating for the changes that you want to see, both men and women, can be really, really beneficial. Liz, you had that great example with your husband the panel. I don't know if you want to share it, but it's I just that's a good example. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, Sorry, Mike. No. <laughs> so, um, my husband, who is in uh, the tech world, in marketing capacity, um, is also very conscious of some of these gender issues that are going on in organizations, probably, um, you know, probably because I talk about it a lot, and I'm asking these questions, and, you know. But <clears throat> there was an example where, you know, he said, uh, you know, a couple, uh, probably a couple months ago, he was asked to speak on a panel, and, um, you know, he got the list of the, the folks that they had invited to speak on the panel, and he, you know, he wrote back, and he said, listen, I'm sorry, I can't do this. And, you know, they said, oh, come on, we really want, you know, we really want to hear from you, I think. And he said, listen, you've got four white guys on this panel. This, is, this isn't representative of technology. This isn't representative of our industry. I mean, this is, this is, this is you know, this is, this is all you can find. Um, and he ended up speaking on the panel with three women. And he was psyched. And he tweeted about it. And he was like, they were awesome. And it was fantastic. Um, but, you know, I'll give him a shout out in that he recognized that. And he took an action. And so for things to change, I say, you know, I think you need more Mike Bulkies in the world, right? <laughs> so, yeah. But, um, you know, else got, you know. I miss Bulkies. <laughs> and um, so I think it's those sorts of things, you know, and I think when we look at, you know, men in this generation, and you're talking about these issues now, and you're thinking about these issues now, and that's going to change, you know, that's going to change how you approach things. So that, you know, even I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call out Luke, right? I'll call, the, you know, your job this summer. You came into our class, and you had been talking all summer with, with a woman who was talking about these issues with you, and so they were salient in your mind. And so you had questions, and you had you know, an experience to share about, and now you're thinking about that as you move in, into the workplace. And other people you know, that have had very strong, you know, Brett, Josh, you guys have had very strong role models, and your mom that have had very strong careers, and, and that shaped your influence. So you know, I, think, I think that's how things change, ultimately, um, when you all start to take on leadership roles. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. Guys.